This is Film Talk, where we interview the brightest minds in filmmaking five days a week. Do you need a great camera for your next shoot? You may want to consider the world's lightest handheld Super 35 digital film camera, Blackmagic's Ursa Mini 4.6K. The Ursa Mini boasts a 4.6K sensor, global shutter, and up to 15 stops of dynamic range. It's perfectly balanced for handheld use and comfortable enough to be used all day long. Scene one, take one. Film Talk Nation, we are greenlit for yet another great show. Vanessa Frank here, and I'm excited to bring you our feature guest today, Cyrus Narasta. Cyrus, are you ready for your close-up? Yes, I am. <laughs> Cyrus Narasta is a writer, producer, and director. Starting out as a television writer, Cyrus received the Penn USA West Literary Award for Best Teleplay twice, and is the only writer in the history of the Penn Awards to win two years in a row in the same category. He wrote the pilot for the USA network show La Femme Nikita, as well as numerous episodes of Falcon Crest. He also wrote and produced the Emmy Award-winning ABC miniseries The Path to 9-11, which starred Oscar winner. Harvey Keitel. Cyrus's film work has been equally illustrious. He wrote and directed The Day Regan Was Shot, which starred Oscar winner Richard Dreyfuss and was executive produced by Oscar winner Oliver Stone. He then went on to co-write and direct the film The Stoning of Sarah M., which starred Jim Caviezel and won runner-up for the Audience Choice Award at the Toronto International Film Festival, amongst numerous other award wins. The Stoning of Sarah M. was condemned and banned by the Iranian government, but thousands of copies were bootlegged into the country and it became became an underground hit in Iran, forcing the government to put a temporary suspension on stoning as a punishment. Cyrus's latest release, The Young Messiah, which he directed and co-wrote, is based on an Anne Rice novel and stars Sean Bean. It will be released in theaters nationwide on March 11th. Cyrus, it's an honor to have you on the show today. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so, Cyrus, how did you first get into the industry? Well, uh... I went to film school at USC, uh, studied there, and then when I got out of school, uh, it took me about five years, but everyone had said you need to start writing because if you can write a script, you've got a better chance of breaking in, at least that was the case at that time. And it took me about five years, but um, I kind of broke through uh, on television and I've uh, been working ever since. So at what point did you kind of realized that you wanted to be directing and producing as well as writing? Well, you know, I always did. Uh, mm -hmm. I loved movies. I wanted to make movies. Uh, uh, writing sort of seemed to be my avenue in. And once you sort of get established as a writer, uh, opportunities usually are hopefully developed to direct and produce and do other things. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'm particularly excited that you're on the show today um, because I actually had the opportunity to um, hear you speak at NRB uh, last year in, in 2015. And one of um, someone that I really respect in the industry, uh, Dr. Ted Bear, has been just raving about your new movie, The Young Messiah, for over a year now. Um, so the, the anticipation is high at this point. Um, and I know that when you spoke at NRB, you gave an incredible story of really this kind of pretty huge trial that you had in the, in the making of this movie. Um, and so I love to ask uh, my guests about kind of what the biggest challenges that they've encountered in their career um, I don't know whether what you experienced, what you shared at NRB in regards to the young Massar was indeed your biggest trial um, or not. <laughs> but certainly I, I would just love it if you could just share with our audience kind of that trajectory of what you went through with getting that production up and running. Well, you know, I think if you're in this business long enough, you end up experiencing a number of trials. <laughs> but I think uh, for that one, for the young Messiah, we had the movie up uh, in early 2013. We were uh, in pre-production, and uh, we were forced to shut down. Um, things just went awry. Uh, our financial person, you know, didn't really know what he was doing at the time. So we had to shut down after we'd spent three million dollars. And when a film shuts down, it's it's like a it's like a funeral. Yeah. Um, you're, you're dead, and your chances of uh, uh, rising again and getting the film made are you know slim and none. Mm. So what we did was. 
um, my wife Betsy wrote the script with me. First thing we tried to do was rewrite the script so that we could, um, you know, reduce the budget. That's the first and cheapest way to reduce the budget on the film is to look at the script. And we actually ended up with, with what we thought was a better script. Mm. And, um, you know, it took a year and eight months of struggling, but the project would not die. And we were very fortunate uh, to get back up and film in 2014 and finished post-production in 2015 and now we're releasing in 2016 yeah and what we discovered at the end of that journey was despite the the heartache of a shutdown we really benefited from it uh, mm -hmm. if we'd actually shot the first time uh through we would have faced probably i don't know three out of four days of rain which would have crippled us as it is, we shot, uh, when we did finally shoot, we had wonderful weather. I think we had one rain day. Uh, we ended up with a better script. Our young boy who plays uh, young Jesus in The Young Messiah has sort of grown grown up enough emotionally and uh, intellectually to really give us a great performance. Yes. Uh, we always thought he had an, an innate talent, but... I think that time there allowed him to really sort of grow up and understand what it was, who he was playing, what it was about. And um, so in many ways, we benefited from that trial that we went through. But, you know, what's a Jesus movie without a resurrection? <laughs> it's, a good, it's a very astute um, point. And I think that... Um, this testimony will really encourage a lot of people who've walked through situations like that where for some reason they've either ended up in development hell or a project has been made and then not released or one of these many, many trials that we can have. And I think hearing a story of how actually, at least in your case, everything came out for the better is, I think, uh, a real encouragement. Um, I from so from what I understand, this uh, this new movie of yours, The Young Messiah, is based on an Anne Rice novel. Um, yeah. And from what I gathered, that's something that really came around through her seeing your work on the stoning of Sarah M and 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 reaching out to you. What does it feel like when, as as a film director, you have one of the most legendary authors, novelists of our time? reaching out to you i mean is that was that pretty especially knowing everything that that how big of a success the adaptation of interview with a vampire was w was that pretty a pretty mind-blowing experience you know it really was because uh what's interesting is uh, betsy and i uh my wife betsy and i were aware of the book when it first came out she had read it and loved it and i remember uh, we were talking about it. it came out about 10 years ago and he told me at the time that i would end up directing the movie adaptation of that book i just thought <laughs> not a chance not no. a chance <laughs> and it, what happened was she wrote a rave review of the stoning of soraya m and through the agents and through just a series of uh coincidences and contacts uh she sent the book to us and we fell in love with it i told the agent you know i can't afford an Anne rice book yeah um, my gosh I'd, I'd really yeah i'd really love to try and set this up and he said well make a few calls see what you can do and i've worked off and on now for gosh over 20 years with chris columbus and his team mm. at 1492 pictures uh michael barnathan is his partner there i I know these guys really well, so I just picked up the phone and called them, and they got it right away. They loved it. They said, "Let's let's try and set this up." Mm. And um, so, you know, and then I was able to bring in people who helped me find the funding on Stony M, mainly Tracy Price of Ocean Blue Entertainment, and we all kind of meshed. And um, it took five years, wow. including the jump, <laughs> including the jump start that I mentioned to you. Oh my gosh! And uh, but it happened, you know, and. Yeah. Um, I'm, we're thrilled, you know. I'm, I'm I'm so excited about the movie. We're now really only a little over a month away from the release. Yeah. And what's really most gratifying to me is um, Anne Rice is tremendously excited about the movie. She loves mm -hmm. it. She's posting about it. Um, she's just over the moon. Yes. Well, I'm I'm really just so looking forward to it, particularly knowing a little bit of how interesting of a person Anne Rice is in regards to her personal walk of faith and how that intersects with her art. I think it's going to make for a really fascinating movie. Um, so, um, you know, one thing, one thing I'd love to mention too mm. is that, you know, her book originally was entitled Christ the Lord out of Egypt. 
Yes. She's so happy with the movie that she retitled the book no. on the reissue, The Young Messiah. Wow. So it's in the bookstore, The Young Messiah, and very few authors will do that. Oh, my gosh. I think that's an expression of her enthusiasm for the movie. Yeah. So is she doing, like, a special release of the of the book for the, yeah. the, the movie release? Yeah. I mean... I can only imagine um, for finances, it's it's kind of incredible to me that it would have even taken this long because I would have imagined that um, having a property, any Anne Rice book optioned would be, would be a pretty, would be a pretty sh- surefire bet. Um, but I guess it just goes to show that making movies is a, a really difficult endeavor that does require a huge amount of patience. Um, so, um, Saras, I know that, as you mentioned, you, you co-write a lot with your wife, Betsy. Um, and I would just love to, for those of us in the, in, that are listening to this that are writers and, and uh, maybe development executives, I think the whole co-writing thing can be a real challenge. I know I've spoken to a lot of writers who've said that that's um, just, they just don't even know how to make such a writing relationship work. What kind of hints and tips and advice can you give those of us who might be interested in some kind of a co-writing partnership? Well, I think the first thing is they should marry uh, their writing partner. Yes. (laughs) Though does that, does that kind of backfire at times when it's like you find yourself at 1130, you know, at 1130 at night lying in bed talking about characters? You know, we do talk about it a lot Mm. and we sort of, we sort of think and talk about it a lot and then sort of put together a structure together. Um, and it just sort of uh, naturally then uh, we decide together, let's go to script. One of us will use on, on the young Messiah. Betsy started first because I really thought she had a, a real handle on it and the characters yeah. better than myself. She knew the book better than I did. And, what happens is she'll do a pass and then she'll kick it over to me. Then I'll go through it, do a mm. pass and kick it back to her. We actually won't write the scenes at the same time in the room together. We'll, we'll, we'll do more uh, outlining and yeah. structural discussion together. And then the actual writing we kind of do separately. Um, yeah. She has an office at one end of the house. My office is in the room. Yeah. And so in terms of the the process of adapting a novel, I mean, candidly, if I was tasked with the job of adapting an Anne Rice novel, I would be terrified because it kind of, you know, and, and, and to boot, it's, you know, kind of um, you had this extra layer on there of effectively telling this kind of apocryphal story of um the young Mossad, the years that, that we don't know about, that where it's a lot of this is speculation, a lot of this is kind of creative uh, interpretation. There are all kinds of, you know, uh, issues, theological issues, et cetera, about orthodoxy. And so we had to sort of readdress some of those in our adaptation. Mm. And we worked with some uh, theologians and uh, pastors and just friends of ours who are uh, you know, uh, religious and just know that better than we do. We're not biblical scholars. Yes. And that presented a whole other challenge here. Now, I think in terms of our adaptation, I think it's a very faithful adaptation to Anne's book, but it's not a literal one. We, I think we got to the essence of what she was trying to accomplish in the book, uh, in the movie, but we went about it sometimes in different ways. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I, in terms of her looking at the adaptation and reading the script, I was really nervous about it. Yeah, I would be. (laughs) Yeah, Betsy was less so. Um, But uh, she thought, no, we got to give it to her. And we did. And we included her in the process. We got notes from her and her thoughts. But I'd say from the beginning, it was just unrelenting enthusiasm from her Mm. about what we were doing. So do you feel that that's pretty important when adapting the novel of someone of, of the stature of Anne Rice. Is that kind of helpful to really have them be a part of that process and invite those notes and keep having that two-way dialogue? Or do you feel like that could can actually make things a lot more difficult? Well, I think it's, let's put it this way, I think it's worth trying with every author. Yeah. Uh, doesn't, it doesn't mean it's always going to work swimmingly. Um, it did with Anne. 
uh, I've adapted, I just did an ad adaptation of, for, of a Stephen King book, and I really was just kind of working through his agents and never really talked to King himself. Oh, wow. But, you know, that's, he's had, I don't know how many books adapted, so he's probably tired of yeah. talking to Yeah, yeah, no, I definitely, I definitely feel like there's some authors to whom it really, really matters, and then others are like, you know what, my job is writing these books, and any afterlife that these books have on different platforms is not as much of a concern to me. No, exactly. I mean, Ernest Hemingway, he's just hand it off, take the money, and run. Yes. <laughs> Well, he didn't live in this era, though, right? It's um, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So, Cyrus, what is one thing you really wish you'd known earlier in your career? Um, wow, that's a good question. You know, I think that um, you get you, you advance in this industry almost, a, I think, a lot quicker and a lot better when people meet you through your work. Yes. Uh, I, I don't think the social scene is the answer. I think the answer is to do good work and the people who read your scripts or see your film or know of your uh, your ability or heard about you through someone else. Those are the ones who are helping because you're both sort of motivated by self-interest to get a movie made or to get uh, to advance a project. And um, I, I, I think that's one way, you know, it's so often people say, well, it's who you know, it's who you know. And I think it's more who you, who you get to know through your yes. work. Absolutely. I, and I, what I really like about that approach is that it's very organic because you're going to be naturally attracting people that like the kind of work you do. If you're making great horror movies, you're going to be attracting people who like that kind of thing, which yeah. has definitely has a, a tremendous amount of value. Um, is that something that you, I mean, obviously, other than this pretty <laughs> major incidents with Anne Rice, but is that something that you found to be very much the case with your other projects? Yes. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I just think, you know, people want to know, then want to know, well, what are you doing next? Yes. Uh, do you have any other ideas? What are you thinking about? Um, or they say, I've got a book by so-and-so that I'd love to adapt into a movie, or I have an idea about whatever, you know, mm. the California Buffalo, and I want to, <laughs> I want somebody to write a script about it. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's just a great way to sort of open up uh, avenues for yourself for the people who get mm. to know your work. Yeah. I think that that's an incredible seal of approval and affirmation because We've all met that guy in the industry who really is most of the most of the buzz about his career is just coming through his own ability to make noise. And there's really something to be said for when it's other people who are your best advocates. That's just a, a sign that you're hitting the right marks in terms of your work. Um, well, Saris, you've been in this industry for many, many, many years, um, both in, in television and film and in numerous capacities during that time. I would love to know what you think is just the most important thing for our listeners to understand right now about the evolution of the film industry. Boy, I wish I knew that secret. I mean, I'll say this. It's, it's changing all the time. Mm. I think uh, a lot of these new, um, sort of these new companies that are getting involved in making films and television shows, I think that's tremendously exciting. Amazon and Netflix, and now apparently Apple is going to get involved. Um, I think that's really a positive for everybody, and um, I think people should, you know, take heart and just keep, you know, plugging away with their scripts and their ideas and keep pushing. I think it's a, it's a, there's certainly a different business than when I started, um, but I also think there's as, as much or more opportunity with all the new media and all the new uh, people coming into the business. Yeah, and I think your um, exhortation to keep pushing holds particular weight when, when one knows that it really took five years of, of fighting and persistence for you to get this this latest movie out there. And I think that um, for those of us who are maybe in that position, it's, uh, yeah, it's just really good to be reminded of that. Well, Cyrus, we're about to enter yeah. our final act in which we're going to be getting some of your top recommendations. But before we do so, let's take a moment to thank our sponsors. Cyrus, welcome to the final act where you'll be showing incredible resources and mind-blowing answers. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. What is the best advice you've ever received? The best advice I ever received is uh, somebody told me that writing is ass feet. 
It's what? Which means you need to sit down and you, it's ask plus seat, which means you need to sit down and do it. That's so true. It's interesting. I heard this story. I can't even remember where I heard it from. I think maybe I read this on the Word Player site, possibly. But this story yeah. of this uh, screenwriting professor, pr Professor Hugh, um, it's like at his first class with this this classroom of college students who are really excited to hear what he has to say about about the the craft of screenwriting. And he just, they all sit down and they're ready for class to start. And he just looks at them and says, go home and write, class dismissed. And and they're really yeah. amused. But that was kind of his lesson was the, the only way you're going to learn this stuff isn't by, as great as theories are, it, there comes a point where you just have to sit down <laughs> on a seat, fire up your laptop and start working. No, I agree. I think you learn more from your own writing than you learn from anything. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, well, Cyrus, if you had just one movie to stake your entire career on, what kind of movie would it be and what talent would you want attached? Uh, of the movies I've made or a movie that no, I want to make? No, dream project. Well, I have a dream project right now uh, about the Battle of New Orleans, uh, and the star of it would be playing Andrew Jackson uh, when he was younger and led the defense of uh, New Orleans from British invasion. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I my. My dream actor would be Gerard Butler to play the part. Oh wow, he's a he's he's so perfect for anything that's kind of you know period. I think. Um, and so, is I that agree. something that you're really drawn towards? Is more because I mean, obviously, Young Messiah is period. Do you are you particularly drawn towards more period stories, or is that just kind of random happens? Well, you know. I've done a lot. I've done a lot of history and historical adaptation. And um, sorry, if you could recommend just one movie for our listeners, what would it be and why? Well, I would recommend my personal favorite, uh, which is Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah, I would. Re I would recommend that because I had the good fortune to meet David Lean uh, many years ago, and he's one of my favorite directors. Mm. And that movie's kind of been a big inspiration for me. Yeah. Um, as far as a movie for your listeners to go see uh, right away, at least next month, is to go see The Young Messiah, directed by Cyrus Naran. <laughs> Good suggestion, and I know I will definitely be taking you up on that and uh, probably grabbing my parents to go see it as well, because um, I think for anyone who has an interest in, um, you know, biblical history, it's... Uh, yeah, it's just it's going to be a fresh take that we haven't we haven't seen before. Um, so yeah, that's right. Maybe for I'm kind of assuming that um, our audience is, has been aware of the project, but would you mind for those in our audience who maybe aren't yet aware of the Young Messiah, could you kind of quickly give us the ele elevator pitch on what the Young Messiah is about? Young Messiah is about a young Jesus at age seven, and um, he takes a journey with his family back to the Holy Land. And in the course of that journey, he's aware that there's something different about him. And he asks, he's asking questions. And Joseph and Mary are sort of reluctant because of all the threats and the dangers and the chaos around him to tell him too much and assume that his father will tell him in time. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens. In the course of, of, of the journey, young Jesus comes to the full comprehension of who he is and what his mission is. Wow. I mean, there's a story. My gosh. It's interesting. I never really thought, I think this is probably the first time in, and you know, I'm, <clears throat> I'm very familiar, oh, f you know, with, with Christian theology. And yet I think it's the, the, really the first time that I've ever pondered that question of that's the ultimate dilemma for a parent. I mean, if you have a child who's adopted, it's always that dilemma of when when do we tell them at what age and how much do we say? I mean, my gosh, what what do you say if you know that your child is is the savior of the earth? I mean, that's a it's a pretty huge parental conundrum. Well, when we get to that scene in the movie, it's quite a scene. Yeah. And um, I think you know this really is a movie for the whole family. I think parents can connect with it. Children can. Um, it, it, it's really um, I just think a very connectable kind of story. We take you inside the Holy Family like you've never been. Yeah, my gosh, that's so fascinating. Are you kind of anticipating a certain amount of, of kickback, of controversy, or has it been fairly well received so far in terms of the different denominations? 
that's interesting because we've been showing the film now in advanced screenings for a while. In fact, we got more coming up uh, to different denominations. And we expected a lot more resistance and pushback really? than we've gotten. What we've gotten really is a lot of cross-denominational uh, support and excitement uh, for the film. You know, on, on the website for the movie, uh, the Young Messiah. Dot com, you can see all the endorsements we've got from all the different uh, denominations. It's really exciting. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's amazing because I would imagine that that would be quite a concern in terms of marketing is, which obviously there's, there's been in the past um, Messiah type stories where there's been, the controversy has actually been a commercial benefit to that project, but I would I would imagine almost if we're if we're really looking inside the Holy Family and 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 getting to see that side of the story that we've maybe not had portrayed before, I could imagine particularly with with um, some of the more Catholic uh, some of the more sorry conservative Catholic denominations that really have such a reverence for Mary and and Mary really being this. Um, saint-like figure i mean i could imagine that her being shown in her humanity and that marriage being shown in its humanity could be uh quite a challenge well you know we've gotten uh well first of all the actress playing mary is sarah lazaro uh who is a who's an angel herself she's a wonderful actress she's so good that i just think that people can't help but be drawn to her whatever their denomination. And, yeah, um, yeah there's, yeah. A, there's a fine line there in how you portray her, but essentially she's a, a loving mother who wants to uh, care for and protect her child. And I think mm. everyone everyone can connect with that. Yeah. I mean, wow. So, so many interesting conundrums, which I sh- I'm sure the, the movie aptly displays, and I feel that it will probably give people a lot of food for thought. Um, Cyrus, is there maybe a website or an app that you find really useful um, as a director, writer, producer, filmmaker um, that you would love to recommend to our audience? Well, there's a site called uh, Cinephalia, mm-hmm. um, Cine, P-H-E-L-I-A or something like that, mm-hmm. that I rather like that has uh, just kind of terrific stories about, you know, classic films and directors and um, really gets sort of behind the scenes a lot. I like that kind of stuff. And it's a terrific site. I've only discovered uh, this year. So mm. could you repeat the, the name of the, could you repeat the name of the site? It's Cinephalia. Cinephalia. Oh yes. I think I saw that recently. Um, is it, does it deal with a lot of more kind of like art house type movies? Well, art house, but also classic yeah. old films. Yes. Um, yes. You know, and, and also just sort of rare Films, yes. you know, and um, it's it's terrific. It's a terrific site. Yes, I took a look at it and I realized it, it kind of amused me. I was like, "Wow, this really isn't for the Fantastic Four kind of crowd. <laughs> this is like no. truly c- cinema enthusiasts um, will have a lot of joy with that website." Um, well, Cyrus, it's time for the martini shot. What parting piece of guidance would you like to share with us? Parting piece of guidance. Well, I think that. You know, sometimes I feel like advice and guidance are can be counterproductive. So my advice is don't take any advice. Just keep trying to do what you want to do. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'm sure that that's uh, an attitude that has served you tremendously, particularly when um, dealing with something like a like what you've dealt with with the the young messiah and um i'm just excited that we're gonna shortly get to have the the benefit of that when we go down to the cinemas and and watch your beautiful new movie um well that's a wrap film talk nation in this industry you're only as good as the people you know and today you've been hanging out with cyrus now i say and myself if you want to go the extra mile head over to filmtalkpodcast.com and type cyrus now i say into the search bar the show notes from today's show will appear along with everything we discussed like Cyrus's recommended movie and website. Cyrus, we appreciate you sharing your priceless insight with us today. Film Talk Nation thanks you, and we'll see you on the red carpet. Thank you.